and it's with uh, Noah Barnett of Virtuous Sop Software. And he's going to talk about understanding today's donor, how to design systems that build lasting donor relationships at scale. Noah is the CMO at Virtuous, the responsive CRM and fundraising platform designed to help you grow giving and create a personalized donor experience at scale, and the co-host of the Responsive Fundraising Podcast. Previously, Noah spent 10 years in fundraising and marketing leadership roles at CauseVox, World Health, HubSpot, and The Adventure Project. He knows firsthand the challenges nonprofits face and is passionate about equipping them with the resources and insights they need to rally people around their cause. No, I'd like to welcome you, and um, you can feel free to keep your webcam on if you'd like during the presentation, or you can turn it off, whichever, do whatever it makes you most comfortable, um, and I will unmute you. Great. Well, I appreciate the uh, invite, Stacey. I'm so thankful for the opportunity to be here and to speak during this amazing conference. Uh, so thanks so much for everybody that's attending, and thanks to you uh, and your team uh, for hosting this amazing day. Uh, as Stacey shared, my name is Noah Barnett, and I work at a company called Virtuous, and we do a lot of research. So we're a nonprofit technology company, um, but in the spirit of making sure that we understand our customers and those nonprofits that we hope to serve, we try to make sure that we keep up to date on what's going on. And so we've spent the last year doing research on today's donor and really trying to understand what today's donor needs and wants from nonprofits? And then how does that inform how you and your organizations should actually adjust how you approach your fundraising? So I'm gonna share a little bit more about that during the presentation today. But I wanna start out with a story. So this little boy's name is Francis. Uh, Francis is someone that I've actually been able to spend a lot of time with. He lives in the slum outside of Kampala, Uganda. And I had the opportunity to work for an international relief nonprofit for uh, almost seven years. And during that time, I oversaw our child development programs and had the opportunity to spend time with Francis and Francis's family. And the one thing through that experience was we were in uh, his uh, community and his mother actually invited us into their home and just had this generous spirit, this heart of generosity and hospitality. And in that moment, I was reminded of something that I had learned when I was 15 during another trip overseas where I was doing development work uh, about the, the unified view of people and how even though we're in different circumstances, um, we're all still human. We're all still people that are growing and trying to live uh, lives that are flourishing and effective. And that's really what we want. And through that experience, I actually just learned about the value of serving others, about serving causes. And that was uh, something that was really important to me and really impactful. And we actually had the opportunity to provide Francis with the opportunity to uh, get an education. And as the program director said, the opportunity to dream again. And I share Francis's story, not so that you have, you know, a background on me or that I look, you know, like someone that's important, but rather to, to also uh, invoke your story of like, why do you actually support the causes that you care about? Why are you doing the work that you're doing? And the reason I bring this up at the beginning of this conversation is because the biggest thing that we learned throughout all of our research when we were looking at today's donor was that giving is deeply personal. And the reasons why you and I both do the work that we've done, and also why your supporters, those that you're thinking about right now, those donors that have been committed to serving with you and alongside you, also volunteers that give of their time, uh, you know, other constituents that you might be serving, all of them give because it's personal. And the reason we start here is because we have to understand why people give, what motivates people to give before we start thinking about how do we build systems or fundraising systems that are effective? How do we engage today's donor? And so we need to understand the principles of why people give before we can really start thinking about fundraising. And so we know giving is deeply personal, but the problem that we found was that most nonprofits are actually handcuffed to traditional fundraising systems that are largely impersonal. And so there's this challenge, there's this break where we have donors and supporters that give to your, your causes, your charities, your rescue missions in a way that is personal. They're either connected to you through a friend, maybe it's a personal conviction uh, to serve, uh, 
uh, through your organization, maybe it's a volunteer opportunity, maybe it's because they know you personally or someone else that supports your cause personally. But once they give to your cause, most of the systems you and I were taught for fundraising or donor cultivation and retention are impersonal. And the thing is, is that that leads to this horrifying stat that 76% of, on average, of donors will actually never give to your cause after their first gift. And this makes sense when we say that giving is deeply personal. Why I give to support your cause is personal, but how I'm being cultivated is impersonal. And so there's a disconnect between my intent as a supporter or maybe your intent or the donors that support your organization. And that disconnect is what disrupts them from giving to you again. And the reason we're laying this groundwork is because I think what we don't realize and I didn't realize when I was doing fundraising is the tactics that we're taught, the tactics that maybe you know, we're trying to optimize or think through are fundamentally broken or disconnected from this idea that donors are giving because it's personal. We're thinking about it from efficiency and effectiveness from our perspective as nonprofit leaders and fundraisers or cause champions, not the donors. And then it creates frustration because this chasm or chasm, sorry, exists between you and your supporters because you don't understand why donors aren't committed to giving to you more or why it's so difficult to get people to give to your cause. And they're giving because it's personal, but they're not understanding what's actually, uh, or they're not feeling as though they're connected and committed to your work. And it's this idea that we have, you know, one to many tactics where we're just like blasting out emails and communications, maybe even uh, uh, passing out flyers or doing campaigns where we're going door to door. But it's this one to many, it's our organizational needs being expressed out and inviting people to be a part of that. It's not a two way conversation. It's also uh, one to many, it's like, hey, we're just trying to go out and find anybody who will support our cause. We're not thinking critically about who should support our cause. Why would someone wanna support our cause? What are the needs and benefits of supporting the work that we're doing? And this really relates back to some research that the Giving USA, um, or Giving USA has done, the Lilly School of Philanthropy has done, and also Adrian Sargent, where they asked the question, why are donors opting out? Why are donors not giving? And they found that it's really related to this two-prong concept, is that donors stop giving when they, feel, uh, when they don't feel connected or confident in the cause or the charity that's working on the cause that they care deeply about. So let me say that again, because I think it's really important. The reason donors stop giving is because they don't feel um, connected to or confident in the charity that's working on a cause that they care deeply about. Now, if we look at the opposite research and we ask why do donors keep giving, we see the same trends. It's through deeper connection and confidence in the charity that's working on a cause that they care deeply about. And this idea is really important because when we start talking about how do you build fundraising systems or how do you really fundraise effectively, because that's what, what I mean by building systems, um, our fundraising systems that engage donors in lasting relationships, needs to come back to this. Our job as fundraisers, our job as nonprofit leaders or cause champions is to ensure that we're making a connection between our supporters and the story, the cause, the mission, the work that you're working on. And how do we maintain that? At the end of the day, that's what fundraising is about. And the better we are as organizations in doing that, the more effective we are gonna be at fundraising and the more sustainable our funding sources will be. And I've made this mistake because I've been on the front lines, uh, you know, fundraising for a cause. And it's so difficult to move away from the needs and the daily tasks and the grind and to actually look at it from the donor's perspective and say, how do we deepen this connection? How do we bridge the gap between our supporters and our story? And I'm going to unpack the research a little bit more, but know that I'm going to share a framework of how we've seen organizations do this well. And hopefully that will provide some insights and value to you and your organizations as you tackle this challenge. And the reason this challenge needs to be worked on now is because we're seeing a huge exodus of people stop or that are stopping to support causes that are needed in our worlds, including the causes that you're working on. We've seen a 25% drop in supporters giving to charitable organizations in general in the last decade. This isn't that they're moving from your charity 
to another. It's that they're opting out. They're not even giving the charity anymore. And in addition to that, we see a turnover of about 50% of donors. So even if you have a bunch of donors, the likelihood of them giving to you year over year is about 50%. And this is a tragedy because it just puts you on a hamster wheel of trying and trying and trying. And I'm sure as I'm saying this, especially in 2020, you felt the same way. And so the question is like, how do we actually do this? Well, the insight we have is that, well, our systems that we're using today are actually not designed to deliver on what keeps donors giving. That idea of being able to bridge the connection between your supporters and your story is not what our fundraising systems are designed to do. Our fundraising systems are optimized for efficiency and our organizational needs. And so we can't look at it and say, well, why isn't the donors giving? Like, what is that? What are the tactics and tips that we can do? It goes deeper than that, because as Paul says, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. And so the results you're getting right now is due to your system being designed in that way. And hopefully this isn't a, you know, a criticism, but it's a call to action to say, if you're frustrated with the fundraising results that you're seeing in your organization right now, you have the power to control that. You have the power to do something different. Now, what we can't do and get frustrated is, is keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. As I'm sure has been well overly quoted, that's the definition of insanity. And so again, the problem now is actually compounded and why this is an urgent thing. And I've been spending a lot of time in 2020 really trying to share this research and ask questions and get better across different verticals, you know, whether it's the work I did in international aid and development or the work that you know, Stacey in this community does in animal welfare. How do we fix this problem? Because we know that there's factors going on right now in our world where our donors are changing, the world you fundraise in, the world that you are championing in a cause in is changing and it's changing rapidly. And so this has compounded these challenge, let alone the fact that we're seeing personalization everywhere where donors are actually being delivered this connection across all aspects of their lives, whether it's your financial institutions or your banks or your clothing company or your entertainment, travel, music, entertainment, all of these categories are personalized. I even receive personalized emails from companies offering like to design outfits for me that are perfectly related to my interests. These are the types of experiences that are being delivered and being exposed to your supporters. So there's an increased expectation from us as charity leaders to deliver similar experiences. And then we've realized that today's donor really expects this personal connection to the causes they care deeply about. And I think this has been brought further into light as we've dealt with the challenges of the pandemic, the social unrest, and the recession that we have in 2020, where we're reevaluating our priorities, we're reevaluating what we invest in. We're looking for things that ha we have connection with and deeper relationship with, and we're making choices on that. If you look at the latest um, Edelman Trust Barometer, which basically just measures how effective um, our organizations at earning and keeping trust. And what we're seeing is that there's a huge exodus of people switching across all categories, you know, even down to things that are, you know, have strong brand uh, ownership or kind of wallet share like cereals and, you know, kind of your basic commodities. People are switching to other brands based on their perception of trust and connection with that brand. And I don't think we as the cause sector are left out of that. And so again, we live in a new world, a new kind of chaos as Seth Godin describes it. And he, I agree with his quote here where he says, some organizations will actually thrive from this increased chaos. Some will be unprepared and some will merely fight it and lose. And I hope the next part of this uh, insight that we'll be sharing is gonna help position you and your organization to ask the right questions that are gonna help you actually thrive within this new reality. Because I believe that the organizations that are intentional about designing their fundraising systems, their ways that they connect supporters to their story, the ones that intentionally design this based on these insights are the ones that are gonna thrive. Because the fundraising systems that drive most of us were built for a world that no longer exists. And so we have to pivot. And so instead of being frustrated like this uh, young lady is, we wanna 
take action and start asking the right questions. And so we feel like there's two important questions you and your organization can begin to ask. The first is, what can we do to close the gap? If we understand fundraising at its core is connecting supporters to our story, what can we do to close the gap? Even small things, how do we bring the giver closer to the good? How do we bridge that gap? Because that's what's going to help bolster our fundraising efforts and ultimately help you fund and run your cause. The next is how do we overcome inertia? Because even though this challenge maybe has been compounded due to the uh, 2020 onslaught that has been given to us uh, and kind of the, that has been dealt to us and revealed, this is a thing, this, these challenges have been socialized for a long time. You know, we've been talking about donor retention and engaging donors more effectively for at least a decade plus, and we've seen nearly zero improvements across the, the benchmarks. They're always sub 50%. The question is like, well, why? And so what we found is that inertia is actually the biggest thing holding us back. The commitment to the way it is, is actually what gets in our way. So even if we come up with creative ideas on how we can close the gap, we have to ask the question, how do we overcome inertia? And so we've talked to a bunch of nonprofits over the last 12 months, and there's good news. You know, many nonprofits are we serve here at Virtuous, but even just well, those that don't aren't even Virtuous customers are bridging this gap and doing it well and seeing incredible results. And the common thread that we see when we try to tease this out and unpack this, what is this? What's driving this effort is a few different things. And I'm actually going to come back to this quote, but the first is that they understand the first principles of fundraising, that they need to connect their supporters to their story using a series of systems. They also understand that there's four levers of growth that they need to measure success from. So when they're trying to say, okay, well, we want to close the gap, the second question would be, well, how are we going to measure whether we're doing that well or not? And so there's four areas of, of measurement. First is acquisition, how do you engage new donors with your nonprofit's impact? Retention, how do you build lasting relationships and earn donor loyalty? And advocacy, how, or sorry, cultivation, how do you deepen the engagement with each donor has with your cause? And how frequently are your donors referring others to support your cause? And so these are the tools that these organizations are using to measure how well they're actually closing the gap. And we took it a step further because we said, okay, we they, there's an understanding that people are of the first principles of fundraising. We need to connect our supporters to our story, and there's a series of systems that we're using to do that. And then we have a measuring stick. We know how we're going to be effective, similar to how we use impact metrics to evaluate how well our organization's doing in impacting the cause area that we're working on. Well, the same is true with fundraising is like, how are we measuring success? How do we know if this is working? And the challenge is we can't look at just funds raised. We have to look at this more deeper or more deeply and look at how are we acquiring new donors and new funding? How are we retaining that? How are we cultivating that? And how are we actually generating net new funding and donors in our donor base from the virality or the, the energy of our current donor base? And if we look at these four measuring, we have a better pulse on what's working, what's not working. Because you'll notice really quickly which of these four areas you might be out of whack on, where you're doing well, and where you can continue to, to invest efforts in. And so the last thing that I wanted to kind of share before um, I get into more of some practical implications is this idea of like, okay, well, now what? Well, how are they doing this? We know what the measuring stick is and we know what we're trying to accomplish, but how? How do we do this? And the thing we keep coming back to is this idea of responsive fundraising, where growth means adopting a responsive mindset. And what that really looks like is a commitment to responding to every donor in a personal way. And in other words, treating all donors like major donors. And so let me explain this a little bit further. We've developed this approach through our research called the responsive framework. And the responsive framework is just something that you can go back to. When you start saying, how should we be fundraising? This is something we can go back to and say, okay, well, let's run through the responsive framework. And so how well are we listening to our donors? Like what's going on right now? What's working? What, what are our supporters saying? Why do they support us? Who's interested in our cause? Who isn't? Who's given to us before and who hasn't? 
listening is all encompassing. It's not just listening with just our ears, but it's listening for the insights that our donors might be telling us. You know, who gave to you in 2019 that hasn't given to you in 2020? Why is that? Maybe there's a survey that we can ask. How do we engage donors at a mass scale to get feedback? How do we do that on a one-on-one -on -one level when we have the opportunity? We can do it in small groups, but there's also other ways that we can collect data. How do we make sure that we're tracking the right data for our organization so we know when the last time a donor gave? We know that they gave last year and didn't give this year. We also know that they supported our cat rescue program. They didn't support our you know, adoption advocacy campaign that we put together. Those are the types of things that you're listening for. And on top of that, you wanna just be able to collect as much information from your supporters as possible. The biggest mistake I've made in my career and continue to do so and trip up over is I spend way too much time in my head, on my laptop and in the board meeting or boardroom trying to figure out what we should do. And what I've realized is as soon as I step out of that, I get out of the office, I get off my computer and I get out of my head and I just ask questions, that's when we, get, we begin to learn. That's where the insights are. And so the responsive fundraising, fundraising framework and those nonprofits that are really successful and we're seeing thrive in this new reality that we live in are starting with questions and they're listening really well and they're doing this at scale. They're doing it in the small ways, but they're also doing it in the big ways. The next part of this is taking those insights and actually turning them into action. So they're using this to connect personally in real time with their supporters, and they're doing this with automated emails and tasks and segmentation so that they can better connect and use these signals that they're listening to um, to connect with the right donors at the right time with the right message. The third thing that they're doing is they're suggesting what the next steps are in a personal way. And what I mean by that is, you know, there's a couple hundred people in the audience right now. And if I would just send out a blast email and say, hey, support my cause, um, I'm putting the onus on you to A, like opt in that this is for you, and B, to actually decide how you should get involved or what getting involved really looks like. Now, how the responsive framework and those nonprofits that are trying to use responsive uh, methodology in their fundraising are doing is they're segmenting their supporters they're connecting at the right time. So let's use the example of supporters that gave last year that haven't given this year. And they're suggesting the next right step. And so instead of asking those individuals to give another $100 gift, because you've probably asked them all year for that, it could be to ask them to attend a seminar where your executive director is actually sharing the vision for how your organization has been impacted by 2020 and where you're looking to go and how partners are coming alongside you. It could be a simple invitation to a Zoom call that could be the next right step. It also could be a volunteer, you know, virtual volunteer opportunity, or if you've reopened in a way that volunteers can safely get back involved. It could also be asking for a monthly gift, not a big one-time gift, or it might just be for them to go watch a video or share a picture of their animals and why they care and why they invest in and believe that that's something people should do. There's a lot of things you can suggest pe people do and it's not always the same. And so the responsive framework encourages organizations to suggest the right thing to the right people at the right time. And there's a lot of different ways that that can play out. But these are the core principles of what responsive organizations, those that are trying to build systems for today's donor are putting together uh, to really grow and to begin to thrive uh, amidst the chaos of the current moment. So Stacy. I'm right to assume we only have five more minutes. Is that right? Uh, nope. You actually you have you have more than five minutes. Nope. You have till three okay. thirty. So we have time for Q and A afterwards. Perfect. So take as much time as you want. Excellent. Well, I'll dive into all the rest of the impact though. I was mistaken on my end. I didn't. I thought it was thirty minutes. Um, so yeah, we'll go through the rest of this, and I'll actually dive deep into this. So if this has been intriguing, and you're like, well, I get it. I see what you're saying. I understand that there's this framework. I'm gonna now unpack this like further and we're gonna go in as deep as we can. And I definitely wanna leave time for questions. So let's keep going. So remember this approach that we talked about at the beginning where we said, you know, giving is deeply personal, but fundraising is relatively impersonal. And we kind of put donors through this sausage grinder where we're just like, oh, we'll send you the appeal and we'll hope for the best. And the outcome is uh, a significant amount of attrition. Now, 
imagine for a moment, instead of doing that, we met this individual named Lisa. And Lisa was invited to an event. It was probably a virtual event if it was 2020 by a friend. And after that, she actually receives a thank you email with a two question survey on what their interests are. You know, why did they attend the event? You know, what, what do you actually care about? Here's like maybe five or six things that are relatable to your organization, but you're just asking, hey, Lisa, like what's of interest to you? And now a day later, you've actually asked the friend who invited Lisa to give her a call and thank her. And then two days later, she receives a text message from the programs team based on her interests that she gave. And if she said, hey, you know, I'm really interested in you know, the adoption advocacy campaigns and how we can increase the amount of impact that we're having in this specific area, maybe you send her a personalized appeal that goes to, goes to that. Now, Lisa visits your website. She doesn't do anything. She just comes, checks your organization out a little bit further. And then a day later, you actually email her again, asking her to make a, a, a contribution or partner with your, with your organization. And now Lisa gives and actually receives a thank you postcard with a great picture celebrating the impact that you're having together a few days later. Now, this is all based on the donor's timing and the intent, it's hyper-personalized, and it's actually multi-channel. And this is the type of campaign that we're seeing really work. And now the question is, how do we actually scale this up? Like, how do we take this type of campaign and do this for all of our donors? Whether you know, it's Tim, who just gave a first gift to your organization, or Rhonda, who visited your website and actually didn't give, what should you do about that? Or maybe it's Lynn, who hasn't given in a long month, or James actually volunteered for your organization, and how do you follow up with them? What, what's the next step? And what this does is this creates this idea where you're beginning to take the personal intent, the giving, uh, the, the reason why people give to your organization, and begin to allowing that to indicate how they're cultivated and how they engage more deeply with your organization. And what we see is that when this approach is taken, even in small ways, even when we just personalize new donor outreach, when the new donor gives, we customize that, even at the minimum, we still see increased donor retention because we're bridging connection. We see increased average gift because there's a higher level of confidence and increased engagement. And that's just because we're doing an effective job at connecting our supporters to our story. And there's a lot of technology now, and obviously Virtuous is a technology partner who helps organizations execute these types of things. But even without that, even using free tools like MailChimp or volunteers to make phone calls, or even just small mail campaigns where you're able to send out individual postcards every week to people that are at different stages of the journey with your organization. These small little touches in a personal way can have a huge impact on the overall success of your programs. Responsive isn't a huge leap. Becoming responsive is one step at a time to say, hey, we understand what successful fundraising looks like, and we're taking steps to move in that direction. That's really what becoming responsive is, and we see organizations continue to move in that direction are seeing these results um, in their systems. So I kind of want to take a few moments to actually unpack each of these uh, portions of the framework a little bit further and hopefully provide more color on how you can use this framework practically in your organization. So the first part of the framework is listening. And I've talked extensively about the conceptual idea of what does it mean to listen? But a few practical things that come out of this framework are things like donor personas. And so you may have heard of this referred to as donor segmentation or just segmenting your donors. But what we always talk about is creating these ideas of donor persona. So you're using donor signals to actually create different identities and begin to segment your messaging and your appeals and your fundraising based on those personas. So instead of looking at your donor base of a couple hundred or even a couple thousand and saying, hey, all of these people are the same, we're gonna send them the November appeal or the year end appeal or the annual fund appeal. We're actually customizing the message on what we know about them. And I'll give some more um, ideas on what that could look like in just a minute. The other thing is surveys and using third-party data. Again, the biggest mistake I've made is not asking enough questions. And I think many nonprofits, and maybe you're in this boat too, is we don't ask enough questions. We just assume and take action. And so using surveys, either on an annual basis even, or actually dynamic surveying, where once someone gives to you, survey them then, or if someone volunteers with you, survey them then. 
if someone gives to you on your website, you can put a survey on the thank you page. So they immediately get to tell you why they gave to your organization today, what they care about, and what are some other things that your organization does that they're interested in hearing about. All of these other steps are basically telling people that you're asking them on how they want to engage with you. And part of being responsive when you look at responsive or uh, relationship science is that responsiveness starts with that questions and then acts on the knowledge that they learn through those questions. That's what responsiveness is all about. You're informing your actions based on what you're hearing and the feedback that you're receiving. And so surveys are a brilliant tool. And one thing you can do on a regular basis, even, you know, every six months, you can send out a survey to your donors and ask just a few different questions. The last thing is digital behavior tracking. One thing that's really interesting now, Virtuous offers this, but other opportunities like Facebook and others offer this as well, where you can begin to track when people open your emails, when they click on your emails, when they visit your website, what pages on, their, on your website did they visit? When was the last time they came to their website? And when was you know the first time they came to your website? All of these things are helpful to inform how you might begin to cultivate those individuals in different ways. You know a donor that comes to your website and makes a donation, but do you know all the people that visit your website and never make a donation? Or they visit your website to learn more about your programs and then leave? We're missing out on opportunities to follow up and continue that conversation by not tracking these types of things. And so these are three different ways that you can begin to listen and the inputs that are the outputs that what of that listening and what the impact would be. So the next question that we get asked a lot, and that's why we put together this slide, is like, what are you actually listening for? Like, I understand we should get feedback. I think I understand we should be active listeners, maybe surveys, et cetera. But what are we actually listening for? And so we've broken this down into three types of donor signals you should be listening. The first is involvement, you know, and the question is, how are your donors engaging? Are they active donors for more than four years? Are there, what's their lifetime giving to you? Maybe they volunteered, they've used your services in the past, um, they've attended events. All of this is involvement signals. Maybe they're a first time donor and they've given online $500. That's involvement. So that's the basic level. How was a donor involved? The next is interest, which is what they engaged with. Like, do they give monthly to you, you know, in a support program? Have they volunteered uh, to be an advocate? Have they requested more info on some of your programs? Have they viewed a specific page on your website? All of these are types of are, are signals that can inform what do they actually care about? How are they engaging with our organization, not just what they're doing? The last is intent. And intent is almost the most important one. And it's the one I think that presents the biggest opportunity for us as nonprofit leaders and cause champions to really begin to bridge that gap between our supporters and our story in more significant ways. And if we really understand why a donor is engaging with us, we can use that to really inform how we engage that individual more deeply with our cause. And so I'll give you an example from my work that I did with World Help. Um, even though it's a completely different cause area, I think there might be some parallels that may be helpful for you. And so we did a survey at World Health to a group of supporters that all elicited the same interest and involvement. So they were all interested in our child development programs and they were all involved at kind of the relatively same level or same kind of tier of giving. And we knew that we could do a better job at trying to like cultivate these individuals like we really didn't understand it felt kind of like a black box and we were like we know they're committed we know they give to us they know they give to these programs but why and so we surveyed and we actually got a huge influx of uh, responses i think it was over a thousand uh, responses that we were able to receive and within that feedback even though we only asked a few open-ended questions like why did you first start giving to us why do you continue to give to us how would you describe our programs to someone else? Just three open-ended questions. We were able to get a huge set of insights that allowed us to see that there was kind of three bubbled up groups of people around what their intent was or why they supported us. One group of individuals um, were kind of doing this because you know they had children in their own home like I do, you know, I have three boys, 
and they were using this investment as kind of an extension of their family's values. The other group of people actually gave to our organization and supported these programs because they actually didn't have children in their home. They were little empty nesters, uh, their, them and their partner um, couldn't actually have children or what weren't able to do, um, have children in their own lives for some reason or another. Um, or they just didn't have children because maybe they didn't have a partner or they weren't really pursuing that, but they believed fundamentally in the value of educating and investing in the future generation. Even though there's slight nuances where that feels similar to the first group, it's very different because why those people give fundamentally is different than the first group. And the third group we identified was they just supported our programs because they believed what Nelson Mandela said. We're educating children in impoverished communities is the best way to tackle poverty. And so they were looking at this as at a more macroeconomic lens that was much higher picture. And that's why they were giving. That's why they continued to support our programs. And what this gave us the opportunity to do was to begin to cultivate these supporters in different ways and deepen that engagement and actually see tremendous growth just from cultivating donors through the lens of why they support us. The other thing it allowed us to do was actually to go out into the audience, out into the world and present these types of stories and actually invite others that had maybe similar desires, but they just didn't necessarily know exactly how to get involved. We were able to use this to acquire new supporters. And so we had this campaign called Why Sponsor, and we were able to showcase the different reasons why people supported our programs. And that gave a connection point, an anchor, to invite other people into our donor base and supporting our cause. And it was just by first starting and saying, you know, how are we listening well? So the second part of the framework is connect. So we've talked about listen, and now we need to do something with it. And this is where connect comes in. I've already talked through some of these in Lisa's story that I shared earlier, but I wanna kind of illustrate them further. And so one thing that we've seen work really well for our customers here at Virtuous, but even others that we've talked to, is the idea of using connection or uh, kind of dynamic or personalized connection, specifically for new donors or first time donors. And so when a donor comes in, how do you make sure you're tagging them in the right way? You're sending them an email, inviting them to be a part of your organization in a specific way that they would like. You're also assigning a task for maybe a volunteer or the executive director to make a phone call for them. You're sending a second email, inviting them to be a part of something else, or maybe the next step that makes the most sense for them. And they might send a text message or an automated letter. And the idea here is, is that because the donor gave, you're running a campaign, a dynamic campaign off of the donor's activity. It's not in November, we're gonna send an appeal. It's we're gonna design a campaign so that anybody who gives to us for the first time ever is cultivated in a specific way that feels personal and really, again, starts them off by connecting them as a supporter to our story and our mission and really deeply engaging them. And what you're trying to do here is actually map out the ideal donor journey and put into place different programs, systems that are gonna help you cultivate those donors to the next milestone on that journey. And so one thing we also see is like, milestones that a donor has is a great way for you to also begin to deepen connection. And when we say milestones, there could be a variety of them. In this example here, we're talking about someone who's given a thousand dollars year to date. Now that could have been over 12 months, it could have been in a month, it could have been over 12 years. But the idea is this is a milestone which humans and kind of uh, the human experience really enjoys celebrating and kind of making a note of different milestones, you can use those same milestones to actually cultivate a relationship further with your donors by saying, we just recognize you that this has happened. Like you've given us a thousand dollars over the lifetime. You've been a partner with us. And that's something that we should make sure that we acknowledge. We've seen organizations do this with anniversaries. So it could be that this is the third year a donor's partnered with you. It could even be around birthdays where it's saying, hey, you've spent another year partnering with us and today's your birthday and we're so grateful for you and the impact and the investment that you're making and we're excited to do it again over the next 12 months. The other opportunity here is that when you hit a milestone, 
there's always a question of, okay, well, what did I do to get here? Which is something you're acknowledging, but it's also what next? And so using the responsive framework, you can actually begin to suggest what the next right steps are. If someone's been giving to you for a year, what do you typically expect from a donor? What have others do other donors done in that second year? And you can begin to showcase that to your supporters. There's a great quote that I actually had to skip over earlier in the presentation today by uh, the founder of Save the Children. And she said this in 1890, and she said, you know, donors aren't ungenerous, they're just unimaginative and very busy. And it's our job as fundraisers to present the facts in such a way as to touch the imagination of the world. And so what I love about the quote is it illustrates that our donors, those that you're reaching out to, potential donors, it's not that they're ungenerous, they're just un, are unbelievably busy and unimaginative. And it's our job to help close the gap there and begin to show what's possible. And so when someone's given to you for a year, the question becomes like, what next? Like I've already donated to your organization, like I'm not sure what else I could be doing or what a longer, deeper partnership looks like with your organization. But that deep connection, as we said earlier, is what's gonna help you increase retention and ultimately help you grow giving. And so it's our job as fundraisers, as you, as a cause champion to say, what is next? What how, do other donors do to deepen their connection with our organization and really illuminate that path for the supporter to know what they should do next and how they can get involved. So the last thing here, and then we're gonna open it up for questions is this idea of suggest. And I've spent a lot of time already talking about this. So I'm just gonna blow through this really quickly. But the, the question becomes with suggest is that it's not about asking someone to do something for you. It's suggesting that someone does something that you think that they're more likely to do. And so this is not that different than what Netflix probably has done to you or uh, in my case, I have children, so Disney Plus is a, a big thing in our house, um, or even YouTube does on a regular basis, where they're suggesting the next right thing, and that next right thing isn't random. It's based on what I've done up until that point. And so the biggest part, or biggest difference between the responsive approach to raising money and the traditional approach to raising money is that we're framing this in it as a suggestion. And that means it's informed by what we know about you, what we've seen you do and what we think you would like to do next, or what we think based on your actions and your intent, you should do next and presenting that. And again, whether that's volunteering, making a donation, coming to a virtual event, watching a video, more about the cause area that you're working on. All of these are suggestions. And the thing is, is that you don't need to get them from zero to 10 every time you ask them to do something. You're suggesting that they do the next right thing. And you can do that in small ways and you can do that in big ways. It's always just about building on the momentum and continuing that conversation. I'm gonna land on this uh, last example because I think it's a great uh, case study where it kind of pulls all the elements of responsive fundraising together and illustrates it in one simple email. So WOTC is an organization that believes that universal health care should be available to everyone, especially children in impoverished communities. And the thing about WOTC is, is that they provide surgeries, uh, much needed medical attention to you know, children in communities that are impoverished all around the world. And they do this through a team of doctors, uh, nurses, medical staff, and that are kind of all remote. And what WOTC does is they actually go out and raise money to help fund the impact of these surgeries, the costs that are related to them. So it's kind of like this retroactive thing where they, they're delivering surgeries and they're raising money and offering the opportunity for supporters to be a part of making that possible. And so in this case, this email was sent to a donor named Kyle after he had made an initial donation to the organization to support this little girl uh, named Estella. I'm gonna read through it because I think there's some nuances here that are subtle, that are actually extremely important and make this email very effective. And so first it says, Kyle, meet Peter. Now, Peter is the doctor in Guatemala that actually delivered the surgery that Kyle helped fund. And it says, he leads the team that cared for Estella, the patient from Guatemala you supported. And he wrote you this note. And it's kind of this general note, but they've personalized it 
uh, to Kyle. And it basically is just kind of this, hey, we're so grateful for your partnership. We hope you uh, have a great Valentine's Day. Thanks for being on this journey with us. So again, personalized to Kyle. They're introducing him to another person. They're talking about how Kyle impacted a person with another person. So Kyle and Peter came together to help Estella, who lives in Guatemala. The specificity here is so important. And again, I'm sure there was 10, 15, 20, maybe 100 other donors that received a similar email, but they also were a part of this. But it's the specificity that's so important because you're calling out, hey, you meet Peter. That's a very human thing. Hey, you helped Estella. She's in a hospital in Guatemala and you made it better. Here's a personal note for you. Those are all great. But here's where there's a subtle nuance at the end of this email that is so impactful. And every time I read this email, I want to give more money to Watsi because I do think it's just a brilliant thing that they do. And so they've done this connection. They're, they're meeting Kyle where he was. They're talking to Kyle about the impact that he has. And then this last note says, this Valentine's Day support one of Peter's patients. Now that seems subtle because you're like, oh yeah, okay. They're just asking for another donation. But the thing here is that you just told Kyle that Kyle and Peter came together to help Estella. Peter now thanked Kyle. And at the end, they're basically saying, hey, you can come alongside Peter again. And the nuance of this could have been more general. They could have said, hey, you know, support other children that need surgeries this year. They could have said, hey, you know, support, um, you know, other young girls like Estella. But no, they said, you can help Peter. You can support one of other Peter's patients, which is something you've already done. And so they're bridging this gap and saying, hey, let's build the momentum. Let's suggest something to you that you'll likely to do. And you could probably take the same exact approach and actually mirror it for your organization as well because you're delivering impact. There's somebody doing that impact and there's supporters coming together with you to make that impact happen. And so I think we have an opportunity when we, when we think outside the box, when we become more responsive to do inspiring campaigns here where we have the opportunity to connect our supporters to the story of our causes, which is gonna help, not just because we need more money, but because that money allows us to make a bigger difference in our world and we're all working on causes that are making our world better. And that's important. And I'm excited by the work that we get to do here at Virtuous because our purpose at Virtuous is to help grow generosity because we know by growing generosity, we're helping make our world a better place. And you and the others listening to this are doing that in individualized ways, but that collective effort is what's making our world better. And we're grateful for that. I hope this was helpful. Uh, we've put together this whole system that you can dig into. Um, I have some free resources for you that you can grab uh, by shooting me an email. But the big thing here is that we have a choice. We have to make a decision as to whether we're going to carry on with this traditional system approach and continue to be frust frustrated with our fundraising results and realize that it's just the byproduct of what we do. Or we can become more responsive and we can be personal and dynamic and connected and begin to bridge the gap between our supporters our story. Again, so grateful for everybody. Stacey, I'm going to turn it back over to you for maybe some q and I'm happy to stick around. But if you're interested in any of this um, information, uh, we've actually put together, here we go. Hang on one second. There we go. <laughs> so we've actually put together all of these resources around how do you become responsive into this free guide playbook pack. If you just shoot an email to responsive at virtuouscrm.com, with fundraising day as the subject line, I'd be happy uh, to give you that uh, via email and send you all those resources. So thanks everybody. Awesome, Noah, thank you so much. I just, I think this way of thinking about our donors is something that, you know, even if we aren't using like this powerful CRM package, I think it's just really good to have it in yep. our minds as to like, what's the donor path that this person is taking so that if we have a conversation with them, if we read a note from them, it's important to know what direction they want to go in and what might be their their interest points. Um, so then you can continue an appropriate conversation with them rather than, you know, talking about rabies vaccinations when they're more interested in bottle baby kittens or something like that. So I just it's it's individualizing our donors and um, really building on that and. I think sometimes we don't necessarily think about that. So 
Um, but one question yeah. around that is, there's a lot of personal information that's getting gathered and, and how are you accessing that information? Are you asking the people to fill out the, inf the donors themselves? Um, people are saying, mm -hmm. you know, I've wanted to send birthday cards to people, but I feel like I can't ask them what their birthday is. And so, um, mm -hmm. you know, what are your recommendations for finding out some of that information? And what about asking like what their income levels are and that kind of thing? So how do you yeah. find that profile? So there, so there's two different ways. First party data, which means you've gotten this or received this either based on a direct input from a donor or from the activity that they've had with your organization is obviously the, the best type of data. And I think asking donors for information or asking questions that are relevant is should be incorporated in everything. So if there's a reason why we wanna ask them for their birthday, the, the caveat here is when we collect information and don't tell people why. And so if I was gonna collect a birthday, you might say, you know, like the reason we collect birthdays is because we just love sending, you know, cat birthday cards to everybody to celebrate. And I think there's like a humanity in acknowledging, hey, like you're more than the dollar amount you put on our donation form. And we just wanna learn more information with you about you because we wanna partner with you. We're gonna go on this journey together. Um, you can also get creative by not asking for the year if you think that's more sensitive and just collect the month and day. Uh, from them. So there's a lot of different ways that only collect what you really need and you're going to leverage. But then if you are collecting something that you think, man, I don't know if they want to give that to me, make sure you tell them why. And I think as long as you're transparent about what you're using data for, I think it's really helpful. Now, the flip side to that question was like, how do you get access to other data? And fortunately and unfortunately, we live in a world where access to data and public data is abundant. And so the amount of data you can find out about somebody just by having their email address or their physical addre address is pretty significant. And you can do it in a legal way. It's not doing illegal things, but there's things like wealth research firms that you can get data on. We partner with one called Donor Search, And so we actually have donor search data uh, pulled into our CRM. So anytime a donor comes on the file, we actually run them through all of donor searches, uh, public data files. And we're able to give you things like you mentioned, like birthdays, uh, their address, their likely income level, and a bunch of other insights that is public data that they've been able to source. We also run things through social profiles. So again, we live in a world where people are sharing information all the time. And so you're able to access that as well through some third-party data services that again, are just collecting public data that's out there. They're just doing it more efficiently uh, in a programmatic way. And then layering that into your first-party data uh, that you have on someone is gonna help you build out that unified profile um, of, a, of a donor. So you can see here, um, this is what we do in Virtuous. But again, most modern CRMs should be giving you this type of data. You should look for ways to be able to leverage some of this as well. I've also heard some people have um, used Zillow as a way of just trying to get a sense of what their potential net worth is or what their value yep. is, whatever. So if you're looking at some free or, or lower cost options just to get a sense of some research, then um, you can go with that. Um, what about if exactly. you are a smaller group just sort of um, starting out, uh, it, is there a database that you would recommend maybe, maybe you know, they can't afford the virtuous level at this point in time, but what would put them on the right path for building forward? Are there some affordable CRMs that, you, that you've worked with and know about? Yeah, no, there's so many great uh, platforms out there. I think to answer the question uh, first, the first part of that question is you should have something uh, and you should start as early as possible. Um, there's ways to do that even in spreadsheets and like free office programs. But really, as soon as you can get a database, the better, because it becomes harder if you're trying to retroactively collect data at a certain time. Um, and luckily, there are ones out there that are very low cost or free, but centralizing all of your donor data and just your constituent, your volunteer data, all of that's going to be really important. Um, if you're a really small organization that's just starting out, uh, we have friends over at Little Green Light, uh, friends at Kindful. Um, those are all great ones. There's a team at Bloomerang that's also uh, a great tool for serving kind of small uh, entry-level nonprofits. Um, we serve kind of mid and large enterprise uh, nonprofits here at Virtuous. 
Um, but we're always willing to, you know, even point you in the right direction. Even if you reach out to us, if you shoot me an email and tell me more about your situation, I'd be happy to point you to the right platform. We partner with a lot of these other platforms because they are the right tools for a lot of nonprofits. And so I'd be happy to uh, point you in the right direction if that's of interest. Awesome. Noah, thank you so much. This is great. I appreciate it. Um, thank you for joining us today. We have a couple of